Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be back here again, the spacious hall. Uh, the next two weeks, Helmut and I will not be here next Sunday and the Sunday after. So uh, Larry has kindly agreed to lead the session those two Sundays. I should speak a bit louder. Okay, I will try to speak a little louder. Did everybody hear what I said? Hmm? Yeah? Not everything. I mentioned that uh, for the next two Sundays, Helmut and I will not be here and that uh, Larry has kindly agreed to lead the session. So I think that uh, last week we completed the first section, am I right? That we read until the break on page 26. Hmm? So now we should read the next section, which is quite a long one. It goes to page 34. So on page 26, at the break, in the first section, Sri Aurobindo has given us a, um, an overview, and uh, the essence of the nature, the inner nature of King Aswapati. And now he's going to um, show how this nature expresses itself, the experiences, the yoga experiences which he passes through in the course of the yoga of the soul's release. Would you start, please, Sudanya? As a soul, he grew into his larger self. Humanity failed his movement and death. A greater being saw a greater world. A fearless mean for novelists began to erase. The violence of safety reason draws that far. Mind, soul, soul, drive, into divine, dive into the infinite. Even his first steps broke out small out bounds and loitered into a vast of freer air. In hand sustained by transfiguring might, he caught up lightly like a giant bull, left slumbering. In a sealed and secret cave, the powers that sleep unused in man's within, he made a miracle, a normal act, and turned to a common part of divine words, magnificently natural at his height. Efforts that would shatter the strength of mortal heart, pursued in a reality of mighty is aimed to sublime for nature's daily will. The gifts of the spirit crowding came to him. They were his life's pattern and his privilege. A pure perception <coughs> lent its loosened joy, its interest waited not to fail. It enveloped all nature's in a single glance, he looked into the very self of things. Received no more by forms, he saw the soul. In beings, it knew what love to them unknown. It sees the idea in mind, the wish in the heart, it plucked out from the great force of secrecy, the motive which from their own inside men hide. He felt the beating life in other men invade him with their happiness and their grief. Their love, their anger, their unspoken hopes enter in gardens or in pouring waves into the immobile oceans of his calm. He heard the inspired sound of his own thoughts the echo in the horror of the other minds. The world's heart sleep traveled into his dream, his inner self grew near to the other selves, and more a insist with a common guy. Yet stood untouched, king of itself alone, 
Thank you. Uh, a magical accord quickened and attuned to ethereal symphonies, the old earthy springs. It raised the servitors of mind and life to be happy partners in the soul's response. Tissue and nerve were turned to sensitive cause, records of luster and ecstasy. It made the body's means the spirit's ecology. A heavenlier function with a final note, lit with its grace, man's outward earthliness, the soul's experience of its deeper selves, no more slept trapped by matter's dominance. In the dead world, closing us from the wider self into a secrecy of apparent sleep, the mystic trap beyond our waking thoughts, a door parted, built in my in built in by matter's force, releasing things unseen by earthly sense, a world unseen, unknown by outward mind, appeared in the silent spaces of the soul. He sat in secret chambers looking out into the luminous countries of the unknown, unborn, where all things dreamed by the mind are seen and true, and all that the light longs for it is drawn close. He saw the portrait in their starry homes, wearing the glory of a deathless form, laying in the arms of eternal spirits, in the heartbeats of God. He lived in the mystic space where thought is born and will is nursed by an ethereal power and fed on the white milk of the eternal strength till it grows into the likeness of a God. In the witnesses, occult rooms with mind-built walls, unhidden interiors, lurking passages, opened the windows of the inner sight. He owned the house of undivided time. Thank you. Mariage. Uh, Don. Lifting the heavy curtain of the flesh, he stood upon a threshold, serpent watched, and peered into gleaming endless corridors, silent and listening in the silent heart for the coming of the new and the unknown. He gazed across the empty stillnesses and heard the footsteps of the undreamed idea in the far avenues of the beyond. He heard the secret voice, the word that knows, and saw the secret face that is our own. The inner planes uncovered their crystal doors. Strange powers and influences touched his life. A vision came of higher realms than ours. A consciousness of brighter fields and skies, of beings less circumscribed than brief-lived men, and subtler bodies than these passing frames, objects too fine for our material grasp, acts vibrant with a superhuman life, pushed by a superconscience that never flowed through mortal limbs, and lovelier scenes than earth's and happier lives, a consciousness of beauty and of bliss. A knowledge which became what it perceived, replaced the separated sense and heart, and drew all nature into its embrace. The mind leaned out to meet the hidden worlds, air glowed and teemed with marvelous shapes and hues, in the nostrils quivered celestial fragrances, on the tongue lingered the honey of paradise. A channel of universal harmony, hearing was a stream of magic audience, a bed for occult sounds earth cannot hear. Thank you. Patricia. Out of the covered track to the slum, the voice came of a truth submerged, unknown, that flows beneath the cosmic surfaces, only mid an omniscient silence heard, held by intuitive heart and secret sense. It caught the burden of secrecy, sealed and dumb, it voiced the unfulfilled demand of earth and the song of promise of unrealized heavens and all that hides in an omnipotent sea. In the unceasing drama carried by time on its long listening flood that bears the world's insoluble doubt on a pilgrimage without goal, a laughter of sleepless pleasure boned and spewed, and murmurings of desire 
throbbed with satisfaction and content in all the sweetness of the gifts of life. It's large breath and pulse and thrill of hope and fear. It's taste of pangs and tears. It's rapture's poignant beat of sudden bliss, a sigh of its passion and unending pain. Mm. The murmur and whisper of the unheard sounds which crowd around our hearts but find no window to enter, swelled into a canticle of all that suffers to be still unknown, and all that labors vainly to be born and all the sweetness none will ever taste, and all the beauty that will never be. Inaudible to our deaf mortal ears, the wide world rhythms wove their stupendous chant, to which life strives to fit our rhyme beats here, melting our limits in the illimitable, tuning the finite to infinity, a low muttering rose from the subconscient caves, the stammer of the primal ignorance. Answer to that inarticulate questioning there stooped with lightning neck and thunder's wings, a radiant hymn to the inexpressible and the anthem of the superconscient light. All was revealed there, none can hear express. Vision and dream were fables spoken by truth, or symbols more veridical than fact, or were truths enforced by supernatural seals. Do you like to read? Uh, you can get one at the top, where the, the door where you came in. You'll read one. Immortal eyes approached and looked in his, and beings of many kingdoms near and spoke, the ever-living, whom we name as dead, could leave their glory beyond death and birth, to utter the wisdom which exceeds all phrase. The kings of evil and the kings of good, appellants at the recent judgment seat, proclaimed the gospel of their opposites and all believed themselves spokesmen of God. The gods of light and titans of the dark battled for his soul as for a costly price. In every hour, loosed from the quiver of time, there rose a song of new discovery, a old twain's hunt of young experiment. Each day was a spiritual romance as if he was born into a bright new world. Adventure leaped an unexpected frame, and danger brought a keen sweet tang of joy. Each happening was a deep experience. There were high encounters, epic colloquies, and councils came, couched in celestial speech, and honeyed pleadings read from occult lips to help the heart to yield to rapture's call, and sweet temptations stole from beauty's rivers, and sudden ecstasies from a world of bliss. It was a region of wonder and delight. All now his bright, clear audience could receive a constant thrill of mighty unknown things, awakened to new unearthly closenesses, the touch replied to subtle infinities, 
and with the silver cry of opening gates, sights and lightnings leap into the invisible. Thank you. Thank you. Lorraine. There knowing herself by her own termless self, wisdom supernal, <coughs> wisdom supernal, wordless, absolute, set unaccompanied in the eternal calm, all seeing, motionless, sovereign, and alone. Their knowledge needs not words to embody idea. Seeking a house in boundlessness, weary of its homeless immortality, ask not in God's car willing cell to rest, whose single window's quick outlook on things sees only a little arc of God's vast sky, the boundless with the boundless. While there, one can be wider than the world, while there, one is one's own infinity. His center was no more an earthly mind. A power of seeing, silent still his limbs, caught by a voiceless white epiphany into a vision that surpasses form, into a living that surpasses life. He mirrored his still consciousness sustaining all. The voice that only by speech can move the mind became a silent knowledge in the soul, the strength that only in action feels its truth, was lodged now in a mute, omnipotent peace. A leisure in the labor of the worlds, a pause in the joy and anguish of the search, restored the stress of nature to God's calm. A vast unanimity ended life's debate. Thank you. Amit Torch. The bone of thoughts that fathers the universe, the clash of forces struggling to prevail, in the tremendous shock that lights a star, as in the building of a grain of dust. The group that turned the dumb ellipse in space, clouded by the seeking of the world's desire. The long regurgitation of the world's blood. The torment edging the darkest flash of dust. That great scientific in earth's drenard slime and carves a personality. Sorrow by which nature's hunger is fed, the east which creates the 
Thank you. So we can go back to page 26 and look at the sentences of this section in more detail. Mi Hong? Amen. 
Thank you. I think we must arrange to have a water supply here in the hall, mustn't we? Next week we'll do that. Next week we'll arrange for, to have a supply of drinking water here in the hall. We've all got dust in our throats, I think. Hot, dry weather. So we see that uh, this realization of King Asvapati, the soul's release, it doesn't happen all at once. No? There's a gradual growth. He's growing into his larger self, the inner being, the true inner being which Sri Aurobindo has described in the previous section, in the first section. Asvapati is a human being, although an exceptional one, and he has to grow into that larger self. I think that many of the experiences that are described in this section and the next, next ones. Um, Richard Hartz has traced many of them in Sri Aurobindo's record of yoga. In any case, we can be sure that these are all experiences that he himself had. No? So one of the, the first characteristics is this fearless will for knowledge that dares to erase, to wipe out the lines of safety which reason uh, draws for us. The reason tells us uh, thus far and no further. It will be dangerous if you go further in this direction or in this direction. But Sri Aurobindo says those lines of safety which reason draws they uh, bar our mind from soaring very high up into the infinite and they prevent our souls from diving deep into the infinite. So, of course, as long as uh, we have not passed beyond the reasonable state, we, we have to be aware of these lines of safety. But when we are called to go beyond, then we should recognize that they are barring some of our innermost possibilities. Even his first steps broke our small earth bounds, the, the boundaries and limitations of our earthly human nature, and loitered to loiter, it is to walk at ease. Take your time without being in a, in a hurry to enjoy, to take time. They loitered in a vaster, freer air. He can move and enjoy that vastness and freeness. And it's the hands of his inner being, his greater being, are sustained, they are supported by a transfiguring might, a power that changes things completely. He's able to <coughs> catch up, to, to pick up lightly, like a giant's bow left slumbering in a sealed and secret cave. The powers that sleep unused in man within. There are several legends in uh, Indian mythology and even in our Western mythology that speak of individuals whose hands are sustained by a special power who are able to take up and use weapons, powers that ordinary people can't touch. No? There's the idea of uh, King Arthur being able to take the sword that's fixed in the stone, take it out and use it. And uh, we were, in, in the other class, we were thinking about this, these bows, gigantic bows, so heavy that nobody can lift them up. 
I think that uh, um, Rama, yes, uh, Rama going to seek Sita's hand in marriage, her father takes him and shows him this bow that nobody has ever been able to pick up and to string. But he, he's able, his hands are sustained by transfiguring might and he's able to do it. And uh, perhaps we have something similar in um, Mahabharata with Arjuna, who's able to pick up and string and use a bow that nobody else can carry. So here Sri Aurobindo is saying these, these weapons that are, you need a special support in order to be able to use them. They represent the powers that are sleeping within us human beings. We don't use them because we don't know that they are there and we are uh, not given the, the help to, to pick them up and use them. But Aswapati is given that privilege. So in this way, he could make of miracle a normal act. Every day he could do things that would seem miraculous to anybody else. He was able to turn to a common part of divine works, everyday things, uh, efforts that would shatter the strength of mortal hearts. If you try to lift up something that's too strong or push a stone, uh, it can damage your heart, no? The mortal heart, the physical heart. But he's able to um, make such great efforts magnificently natural at this height which he has reached. And in this way, he's able to pursue with a royalty, a sovereignty, a commanding power, a royalty of mighty ease. Easily he can do it. He can pursue aims that are too sublime, too high for nature's daily will, the ordinary, everyday kind of will that we have. The gifts of the spirit crowding came to him. They were his life's pattern and his privilege. And in the passages that follow, um, Sri Aurobindo will describe some of these gifts of the spirit that became Asvapati's the pattern and privilege of his life. Jean-Yves? A true perception land his intimate vision waited not to see. He enveloped all nature in a single glance. He looked into the very self of things. Deceived no more by form, he saw the soul. In beings, it knew what lurked to them unknown. It sees the idea in mind. Wish in the heart, plucked out from grave folds of secrecy, the motives which from their own side men hide. He felt the beating eyes of other men invade him with their happiness and their grief, their love, their anger, their unspoken hopes, anchored in currents. heard the inspired sound of his own thoughts, re-echoed in the roads of other minds, the world's thought streams traveled into his head, his inner self drew near to other selves, and bore the kinship's waves, the coming tide, yet stood and touched, king of itself, alone. Hmm, thank you. So perhaps this is the first of the gifts of the Spirit that comes, this power of pure perception, 
This is obviously not the ordinary uh, sense perception that we make use of. This is a gift of the Spirit and it gives all these possibilities which are described in the following lines. Anybody would like to ask anything about these lines? Hmm. I, uh, I, I got hung up on the previous passage. Yes. Yes. Right. When I was in elementary school in the 50s, you know, the early, um, loitering had only a negative. A negative, yes. And that yes. means you're not to go there. It's mm. like a, you can hang around there. Don't you dare question. Don't you dare whatever. It had all the things holding you back. Mm. Loitering means taking your time, and when you're on your way to school, that's not what you're supposed to do, no? I, yes. well, that's, that's why here it's evoking that freedom of movement. There are no rules and nothing to stop him or hurry him. He can loiter in this vast, uh, freer air, it's a whole atmosphere is something different from what we experience. We have things uh, driving us every day. This has to be done and that has to be done. It's very rarely that we get the leisure uh, to loiter freely. Mm -hmm. These are the um, description of the intermediate zone the mother talks about? No, I don't think so. These are descriptions of the gifts of the spirit. The intermediate zone is a rather dangerous place. As I said, for the man in my agenda, but uh, 1972-73 about the intermediate zone, yeah. yes. It's very dangerous, explain. Yes. So I think we won't go into that just now. This is the opening up of the inner being, and uh, the, he's being gifted these privileges, they're not given to everybody, but it's first of all this pure perception. It's not clouded or muddied in any way, and it gives joy, a joy of light, a lucent joy. And when we perceive something with our senses, uh, somehow those sense data get passed through our nerves, they may get distorted on the way, and then the mind has to work on them. You know? But this pure perception doesn't need to think. It can envelop all nature in a single glance and see into the very self of things. It can see really the truth and the essence of everything. So this is a wonderful intuitive state, pure intuition. So he's not deceived anymore by the outer appearances, by the forms. He can look straight into the soul and the essence of things. And uh, both mother and Sri Aurobindo had this gift. They, they could see in beings when people came to them. Uh, they, they could see things that, about the person that they didn't know, that is lurking within them, unknown possibilities, things from the past, all kinds of things, thoughts. So this pure perception can see, oh, what is in, in the mind of that person in front of me? What is the wish in his heart? It's as if uh, very often when we do things, we are moved by motives that we hide from ourselves, that we keep subconscious. We don't, we think that we are doing for a very good reason, this or that or the other, but there's some hidden motive. He says it's as if they're um, covered up 
with gray curtains, gray folds of secrecy. We keep them subconscious, unconscious to us. But this pure perception, King Aswapati can immediately see what, what is the real motive. And he can perceive the life force of the people around him and the, their feelings, their emotions and feelings uh, flow into him with their happiness, their grief, their love, their anger, their unspoken hopes. Sometimes they just come like currents flowing gently, but sometimes they come in very powerful pouring waves. Um, there's a letter in which Shobindo has spoken about uh, perceiving a, a powerful force of anger coming against him uh, up the stairs uh, into his room attacking him, you know, like that. But the, here it says that even those pouring waves, they enter into the immobile ocean of his calm. He can perceive them, he can perceive what their, their nature, where they come from, but they don't disturb that immobile ocean of his calm. And another thing that this pure perception gives is being aware of the thoughts of other people around the world. He heard the inspired sound of his own thoughts that he has sent out, coming back, re-echoing, as if in a cave or a big building with a curved roof, there will be an echo. So his thoughts have gone out and he hears them coming back to him. Other people think those thoughts and think they're their own thoughts, but he, he knows they have orig where they have originated. And all the thought streams of the world. This is something that we are not much aware of, no? that there's a, an atmosphere of thoughts enveloping the world. And those thought streams come to us, affect us, we pick up ideas, suggestions. But this pure perception enables him to be very, very clear about where those thought streams are coming from and what they are carrying. And in his inner self, all these are the experiences of his inner self, he's feeling very, very closely connected to other people. He can feel uh, the weight of a kinship's tie, connection of somebody who's close to you, who needs help, there's a kind of burden of responsibility. But he, he feels that sympathy and that tie, and yet that doesn't disturb his own state. He remains untouched, king of itself, alone. The inner being keeps its uh, identity, perceives all these streams and movements coming, but remains fully in control of itself, king of itself, and feels its separateness at the same time as the common tie. Is this a, 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 a parallel to what we read in the Life Divine Wednesday? Everybody, please be a body, a, a body awareness of other body Yes, it, in fact, it's a description, a brief, very poetic, beautiful description of what we were reading about last Wednesday, I think, or the Wednesday before, about the state of the being who has a supramental realization, agnostic consciousness, who feels this common tie but is not disturbed by it, is able to still see very, very clearly uh, the right action, the right response, so on. Mm -hmm. Yes? I want to tell you something. For me, 2017, in Norway, for my inner experience, everything was not clean in you, coming, but much more strong. Allow is very, 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 very important. You clean, you give to the divine, but 
also you call when you tell about transformation of some part of you. I call. I call for me this aspect before not saying. I offer to show the do and the mother, mm. but transformation. But now I call on the light. Did I understand you to say that what you have not purified in yourself? Yes, 2017, for me, every scene, every scene, when you cover, when you, in your heart, in your mind, in your perception, every scene comes back very, very It comes clearly. back to you very strongly so that very, you see very it. Strong mm. and adverse force cover. Mm. You don't want, you collaborate. Yeah. 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 Is my yeah. And then the only way to deal with this perception is to offer Everything. it for Every transformation. Time, mm -hmm. I tell you when I came to Grace, I, I, my consciousness after my accident changed totally. Mm -hmm. But recently, some power coming, some part of and use for not good purpose. Mm. Alors, it's very, very interesting. Mm. But I don't collaborate with uh, this part. I offer, I call for the world. Mm. And for them, this morning is uh, 12 years, I am in grace. I tell you, I receive incredible gift <laughs> for my surrender mm. to show them. Thank you. Are we ready to move on? To read on? Yeah. <coughs> Mila? A magical across Britain and a team. Exterior symphonies, the old earth history. It weighs the symbols of mind and life to be happy partners in the soul's response. Tissue and nerve were tuned to sensitive. Records of lust, lust, and ecstasy. He laid the bodies, means the spirits, acolytes. A heavenly function with a finer mold, lived with his grace, man's outward earthliness. The soul experience of his deepest kiss, no more is left trapped by matters only. In the dead world, losing us from higher shell into a secrecy of apparent sleep, the mystic track beyond all walking thoughts, a dog, dog parted, built in by man's force, releasing things unseen by that sense, a world unseen, unknown by outward. Thank you. Sorry? To echo acolyte. Acolytes. Acolytes are assistants and helpers, and especially assistants and helpers to a priest who's doing, uh, preparing a sacrifice. Hmm. He will have some young apprentices. Who, who help him, who hand him the things that he needs, the acolytes. So it's like a servant or an assistant. Yeah. What Jean-Yves read is a, was about inner experiences, no? Um, Aswapati becoming aware, having this pure perception and being able to see into the minds and lives and souls of people around him by an inner perception and keeping himself um, aware, but untouched, alone. Now what Miller read seems to refer to some change in the body, in the physical being. Hmm? There's as if a kind of tuning happening. A musician will attune his instrument before he plays it, make sure that all the, the um, 
the chords are tuned properly. And an accord is when things are in harmony. There's a magical accord, quickened. It made more alive, more sensitive, and more in tune, in tune with ethereal symphonies, the symphonies of the subtle worlds. You know? This attunement and quickening is happening to the old earthy strings, to the, the physical strings of the physical body. The, the earthy mortal strings are getting quickened and attuned to this magical harmony, in tune with those symphonies, not just melodies, but a very, very complex, powerful symphonies of the subtle worlds. And the servitors of mind and life, the parts of us that enable us to think and live, um, these things uh, are lifted up, heightened. They're no longer just servitors of our mind and life. They're able to be happy partners in the soul's response. The body itself and the life and the mind can respond with the soul. So the flesh, the tissue and the nerve get turned. They become more sensitive and they are able to uh, respond to and record luster, light, and ecstasy. In this way, the means of the body, the instrumentation of the body, becomes a servant and helper and supporter to the spirit. So as a result of that, even the human outward earthliness gets tuned to a heavenlier function and a finer, more refined mode of action. It lights up with its grace even the outer being. And as a result, the soul's experience of its deeper sheaths is no longer drugged and intoxicated with the dominance of matter which prevents us from experiencing the inner being properly. The dominance of matter, he says, it's like a dead wall closing us off from our wider self, our deeper, higher, wider self. It cuts us off from this uh, mystic tract, mysterious territory that lies beyond our waking thoughts. But in that dead wall formed by matter's dominance, a door opens up leading into that mystic tract, a secret place. It's almost like a sleep, a trance. And this opening up releases things that our physical senses can't experience. So for Asvapati, because of this change, a world unseen and unknown, unknown to uh, the outward mind, appears, he becomes apparent to him. He's aware of that inner world in the silent spaces of the soul. It's an interesting thing. We think the soul is within us and it must be very small, it's no bigger than the thumb of a man. But all the mystics tell us that the deeper in we go, the more space there is, the vaster and freer and deeper and higher everything is, the secret spaces of the soul. So when we are no longer dominated by matter and the physical heaviness of the material body, we can become aware of these inner spaces. Mm. In the first part of this section, yes. it, is, it is the spirit's privilege, the, the light's pattern and the, privilege. It's the gifts of the spirit 
become his privilege. It's not something that everybody can enjoy. It's given specially to him and to become the pattern of his life. Is that what you wanted to ask? Yes, yeah. So, so these things which he then describes, describes. These, these are the privileges, no? This pure perception and the effects that it has, this refinement of the body and the opening up of the inner spaces. These are all gifts of the Spirit. And that is uh, related to the soul. Yes. His... his Yes. This that the rest of the has only the way to we, we have the potentiality of these experiences, but we, what he's been telling us is that we have to reach a certain stage of development before it's possible. No? A long, dim preparation is man's life, and all the things that we experience are part of that long, dim preparation until at last is reached the giant point where we can break into, break across our nature's border, the limitations of our human nature. We can escape into another realm, supernature's arc of living light. So, we are told this has happened to King Aswapati. It can happen to us also when we've developed enough. But I remember, I think it is in the synthesis of yoga that um, Sri Aurobindo has mentioned some of the, the necessary conditions for that escaping. And he mentions uh, some refinement of the physical substance is a a necessary condition. So I think that's what's being described here, that this um, refinement, this subtleization of the physical substance so that the old earthly uh, strings become usable for a higher purpose, for a subtler purpose. Yes, well, of course, Mother had this uh, capacity from very early on in her life. Um, after the supramental manifestation, she wanted to take advantage of that new power and possibility that had come into matter to achieve as much supramental transformation of the physical being as possible to open the way for others to follow. I don't think that's what exactly what's being described here, but this would be a kind of preparation for that. Mm. I think it's the spiritualization of the mind and the body. This is the gifts of the spirit. After Savitri has her discovery of the soul of the psychic being, then she also experiences a, a psychic transformation that's described in Book 7, Canto 5. The, probably the, um, the effects are similar, but um, these are the gifts of the Spirit. No? And King Aswapati's way is the way of the spiritual realization. So now he's looking into those silent spaces of the soul, uh, would you read? I'm sorry, I don't know your name. George. George. <clears throat> he said, in secret chamber, looking out into the luminous countries of the unknown, where all things dream by the mind as seen and true. I can't read it. It's too big. I just like to Okay, will you read, please? Yes. And all that the light comes from is drawn close. He saw the perfect in the starry heavens, wearing the glory of the deathless God. The name in the arms of the eternal peace, wrapped in the heartbeat of God of the He lived in the mystic space where thought is going on. 
and will be submerged by the ethereal form and fed from the wide mill of the eternal strength till it grows into the likeness of God. In the witness of God looms with mind filled wounds and hidden interiors lurking passages open the windows of the innocent. He owned the house of undivided time, lifting the heavy curtain of the flesh. He stood upon a threshold servant to watch, and peered into weaving endless gardens, silent and listening in the silent heart, for the coming of the new and the unknown. He gazed across the empty stillness and heard the footsteps of the unbreathed heaven in the far avenue of the wind. He heard the secret voice, the word that knows, and saw the secret face that is our own. Mm, thank you. He sits in secret chambers deep inside himself, looking out into the luminous countries of the unborn, the beings who have not been born and who cannot die, the immortal beings. And in those luminous countries, all the high dreams, wonderful dreams we have are seen and true. They really exist. And all that the life longs for, the deep aspirations of the life, it becomes close and accessible. And then I think that we can read about eight different experiences. One of the things he can see is the perfect beings, the ones who are immortal because of perfection. They have starry homes, distant homes of light. And there in their homes, they wear a deathless form, a form that is not subject to death because it is perfect. And those beings are held always in the arms of the eternal's peace. And they experience their wrapped, deeply absorbed in the heartbeats of God's of God ecstasy, divine bliss. Another experience is to be able to live, to dwell in the mystic space where thought is born, where thought comes into existence. And in that space also, the will, the power of will, gets nursed, nourished, and strengthened by an ethereal power, a power that belongs to the highest, the rarest kind of substance. It's fed on the pure white milk which of the eternal strength until the will becomes div divinized, it grows into the likeness of a god. He can also enter the hidden rooms of the witness, the witness consciousness in us. Those rooms, they are hidden away behind mind-built walls. But um, they open their windows so that he can see hidden interiors, lurking passages in the inner world. He becomes an owner, he possesses the house of undivided time. He can see past and present and future in one view. And he's able to lift up this heavy curtain of the physical body and stand on the threshold. Uh, this, uh, Savitri also has to stand on that threshold that's protected and guarded by serpents, by energies, protective guardians. 
he stands on that threshold and he doesn't enter, he doesn't cross the threshold. He just looks, he's peering into those gleaming, endless corridors. He's silent, he's listening in the silent heart. What is going to come? What is going to come into the future? Hmm? Listening for the coming of the new and the unknown. He gazes across those empty stillnesses and he can hear the footsteps of some completely new, undreamed idea, some new divine concept. It's approaching in the far avenues of the beyond, way down those gleaming endless corridors. Something new is approaching. He's able to hear the inner voice, the secret voice that carries knowledge, carries the word of knowledge and creation. And he sees the secret face, that secret divine face that's our own true face. I think these are eight different experiences. You wanted to ask something, Don? No. I think we will stop there for today. We can, we can hear a mother reading some of these passages, and uh, then Prasad has something to share with us. I want to tell you something about uh, eternal peace. Mm. Well, uh, I read, but uh, uh, eternal is uh, when the window and the mother never separate in eternal. When you are experienced, means it means before uh, the one the perfect the alone hasn't separated he hasn't called up his uh, conscious force yeah. to create the world so eternal and infinite these are the states beyond the manifestation before the separation can you help it? Uh, can you play yes. some music yes. now yes two or three passages <coughs>
Thanks to Shopping.